the first tube mixing console for recorded sound was built in our garage. Um, this garage, um, the beams across this garage were too low for my comfort and I kept banging my head against the, 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 the ceiling. It was also a very small garage um, <clears throat> and the day came when I got an order for a piece of equipment which was too large to fit in the garage. We've all heard these funny stories about building a boat in your garage and then not being able to get the boat out. Um, well, that was, would have been the danger with this mixing console. Um, have to demolish the garage to get the product out. But um, <clears throat> we decided to look for a place. Now, I was also working as a consultant to various companies uh, doing uh, microphone design for the Royal Air Force and uh, loudspeaker design for one of the Philips companies in Cambridge. Um, the uh, factory for the Royal Air Force uh, microphone was in Harlow. So it seemed to be logical that we would look for a place that was halfway between the two places and didn't have to travel too much. Um, <clears throat> we found, having looked at many different places, we found an old rectory uh, in the village of Shelford, Little Shelford, a beautiful little Cambridge village. And um, this um, was priced um, at uh, what is it, 15,000 pounds sterling, two acres of land and a large old house built in 1858 with 27 rooms and various outbuildings which was absolutely ideally suited for what we wanted to do. But we didn't have the money to buy this house. Um, my mother was very helpful and contributed some money towards this, but our total budget was just about half that. Our total budget was £7,000 to buy, well, a really outstanding piece of property. Um, <clears throat> We kept on coming back to look at this house, having looked at various others. It seemed to be the ideal place, but we couldn't afford it. Um, every time we looked at it, we had to go and see the rector, um, who was living in a much smaller house now, next door to this great old rectory. And uh, um, he... Uh, suddenly said to me one day when I was taking the key from him, um, oh, he said, you, what's your name? Neve. Are you any relation of Reverend Neve in the Isle of Wight? I was preaching in his church last Sunday. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> that established a sort of point of contact. And he said, well, that's wonderful. He said, we've been praying for a Christian family to come and live in that house. And uh, so... He said, it's so good to welcome you into this uh, village. I said, but hold on, we're not, we can't buy the house, we can't afford it, we're, we're still looking at it, we're still doing our own praying to try and find a way of doing this. Oh, he said, that's all right, the Lord will find a way for you. <laughs> and uh, he was supremely confident, much more confident than we were. But um, this house had been standing empty for quite a long time and was actually deteriorating. Uh, there was a lot of damp getting into it, there were leaks in it and so on and so forth. And uh, I had a call from the uh, real estate agent who was trying to encourage me to buy this house. And I said, no, it's too expensive. He dropped the price by quite a lot, but not enough. And um, um, he said, well, okay, what is your budget? What, what could you go to? I said, £7,000. He said, that's ridiculous. I'm not even going to put that forward to the uh, owners. I said, what do you mean you're not going to put it forward? You're bound to put it forward, no matter how ridiculous it may sound to you. I said, I'll make a formal offer of £7,000 for this house. 
And well, that was the, the ruling in those days that he had to do that, you know, however ridiculous that price might have been. And um, well, he refused to put it forward. And so I called the diocesan people in Cambridge who were uh, really the authorities on this. And I said, you're a real estate guy. You haven't heard from him, have you, with an offer? No. I said, well, I believe he's refused to put my offer forward. OK, so we connected the bits. And he said, well, it's, it's, it's an extremely low price. The property is worth a great deal more than that. I said, but that's my offer. And the house is in bad condition. It's going to take an awful lot of um, refurbishment and money spent on it. And uh, I said, would you be prepared to consider seriously that offer? He said, you better come and see me and um, tell me what you want to use the house for and all that sort of thing. Went to see him in his office in Cambridge and um, explained to him that we were Christians, our basis of business was on Christian principles. I said, this is, there's no such thing as a Christian business. There are Christians in business and they would hope to uh, apply their principles in the business and as well as in their lives. And while I was running this piece of witness, um, the secretary who was in the same room with him um, sitting a little behind him, suddenly came to life and she looked at me and she placed her hands together in an attitude of prayer and she was obviously giving me every kind of visual encouragement to, to carry on. So he said, well, OK, you better try and put this in writing. Write me a letter and we'll see what we can do. There's um, a meeting of the finance committee uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Well, I wrote the letter and... Uh, on the day of the actual meeting, when after, in the afternoon, he called me, he said, Mr. Neve, he said, uh, we've just been discussing your offer, and I've read them the letter. He said, the, the committee is torn apart. Um, there's an absolute 50-50. Um, give me a face saver. So <laughs> I said, no, no, no. Seven thousand pounds is all we can afford. All we can do. That's what. That's what we're going to stick at. Uh, if the Lord wants us to have that house, it's seven thousand pounds. So he said, Mister Neve. He said, What about seven two hundred? Can you give me two hundred pounds? Two. Well, I thought he was talking thousands. You see, and I said, Yeah, I think we could go to seven thousand two hundred. He said, Right. House is yours. <laughs> Well, that was the old rectory in Little Shelford where the business was born. And we had um, uh, undertaken wrongly um, as consultants, because that's what I still called myself, uh, not to employ more than three people in that house. And uh, within 18 months, we had about 30 people. We had refurbished the outbuildings. We had um, people working there far in excess of the planning permission which we had. And there are many uh, episodes during that time of our uh, fighting with the planning permission people. In those days, um, the universities were very much against anything industrial Industry was a dirty word. Cambridge was concentrating on the arts. And we were this dirty industry. A clean industry, as it happened, of course. Electronics is clean. It wasn't, you know, steam engineering or something. But um, <clears throat> we nevertheless had many fights with the planners every time we wanted to get some small expansion and so on. Um, in... 1968, um, we found where well, we realized that we could not continue in this house. It was far smaller than our needs were now developing. And uh, um, we had to build a factory. And the planners 
were opposing us at every step of the way. Finally, we had agreement from them, providing we did not exceed 10,000 square feet to build a factory um, about 10 miles south of Cambridge in the little town of Melbourne. And again, this was amazing. It wasn't now a question that we didn't have the money because the business had developed extremely well and had become profitable. And, um, um, <clears throat> but it was the planners that were the difficulty. We had, uh, uh, had to take, we had to give them an undertaking that we would not, um, if we wanted to expand beyond that 10,000 square feet in Melbourne, that we would do it in a development area, different, uh, some, some part of the country where they were not opposed to this dirty industry. And, uh, which we agreed to because we thought, oh, 10,000 square feet, we'll never exceed that. But literally within two years, we had to exceed it. And we, again, cutting a long story short, we got planning permission to build in Scotland, which was then a development area, which meant that we had to train people, the only uh, people available, the only labour force available, were farm workers, um, um, delightful people, but they were very skillful at digging potatoes and not building consoles. And so we had to employ local people. Um, <clears throat> and again, I could tell you a great many stories against the way in which the planners were opposing us at every turn. Um, Melbourne developed from 10,000 square feet to 25,000 square feet in the next three years. And uh, the business just romped away. Um, in Scotland, we used to have the modules built. They did a very good job for us. And uh, um, <clears throat> So the modules would be uh, carted down 300 miles from the lowlands of Scotland um, to Melbourne and would be inserted into the consoles. The consoles were built and assembled still at Melbourne. And it's very similar to what we do here today. Contractors build the, con the, the modules and we construct the mixing consoles here at Flight Acres. It's a parallel situation. But we sold the company. Um, it was a three-year process of selling and uh, uh, initiated in 1973. Uh, it was, the sale was completed in 1975. And we moved out of the Shelford House um, just around the same time. And we moved into the uh, town, the city of Cambridge, um, during that same year into a much smaller house, much more manageable and so on. Can you give us a 